welcome back to the Donahue Group. We're together again. Uh, Ken Risto, Tom Paneski, Cal Potter, I'm Mary Lynn Donahue, talking about the great issues of the day, both at the uh, uh, local, state, and today I think we may even as make it. As we perceive them to be. <laughs> yeah, as we perceive them to be uh, uh, at the national level. And you need to always at least let me get the introduction now before, Sorry. <laughs> before rudely interrupting. Um, one of the interesting, uh, almost historic, uh, developments at the state legislature was the introduction, the co-sponsorship of uh, semi-real campaign finance reform uh, by Mike Ellis and um, uh, Fred Risser. Uh, it is uh, still in committee at the state level, I believe, but just the fact that it was introduced, I think, is in response to citizen concerns about it. Cal, you're our, our state person, having lived in Prospered at the in the legislature for a number of you years. Know, prospered, <laughs> <laughs> prospered with campaign finance. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, not in those days. <laughs> so, well, I, I think it's long overdue. I, I I have over the years seen uh, the influence of special interest groups become greater and greater, and uh, as a result of their influence, not only be because they hire uh, hired guns called lobbyists. Uh, but also because of uh, the influence they have during a campaign. Uh, my first uh, assembly campaign uh, way back in the early 70s was, I think I spent $3,000. Um, now it's not unusual to see a state senate candidate spending a million uh, for a job that pays, what, at $45,000 a year. Uh, there's something disconnecting there between the average uh, senator and his, con his or her constituency and the shaking down of groups, mostly, uh, to get a million dollars to finance a political campaign. And the resulting representation that you get from that, I think, is more beholden to those who have given that million dollars than it is to listen to the people. Um, sure, there are ex uh, exceptions to that. But I think when you start uh, getting to the high dollar amounts, and that's, we're seeing that now, projections on what the governor's race is going to cost. Uh, and we know what congressional races and, st and U.S. Senate races cost. Uh, we know there is a, a, a disconnect from the average person uh, and what groups tend to expect after they give literally tens of thousands of dollars to a candidate. Uh, I think this has to stop. Uh, we have enough uh, challenges in our society uh, that need to be met. And we need to have a, a uh, I think we need to elevate our legislative perceptions to that which we expect out of our judiciary. I mean, we, we don't we even let allow our judges in the state to run by party, uh, unlike Illinois in some places. But they certainly where, have to raise money. I mean, they do, and, and that, that has been a question of where they do get their money from. But, you know, historically, we've always said this branch of government ought not to be Democrat or Republican. It ought not to uh, uh, be uh, commenting on cases before they're heard and sort of very hands-off type of uh, and pure type of uh, perception that we have of judicial races. Whereas in the legislature, we've allowed uh, interest groups and lobbyists literally to become so deeply involved that it goes beyond partisanship. It goes beyond who's uh, carrying water for who. And, and I think the people lose out in the long run. So I'm glad to see that at least out of a Senate committee on the state level, Senator Risser, a Democrat, and Senator Ellis, a Republican, have, have gotten a bill um, out of committee in a five to zero vote. That's true. Uh, and that now will be debated on the floor of the state Senate. And hopefully when this session is done, we will have something that we haven't had for decades in this state, a successful attempt at campaign uh, finance reform. Tom Paneski, stand up for free speech. Isn't this no, no, just no, no. a... I'm just going to say, you can do all you want with campaign financing, but money finds holes. Just like water finds holes. Just like we saw in the presidential election, campaign finance reform. They found the water flowed to another spot. So, applaud the efforts, and uh, but I think it's uh, the money will flow to the place where there is no campaign finance reform. Now, you're not going to cover everything. That's, that's sort of how I... I think about it, and uh, I, I, you know. I would contend that where the water, uh, the, the money water here flows, is usually as a result of lobbying by special interest groups <laughs> during the debate on a campaign finance group that for their own exemption. Accepted. It's just like we've had numerous <laughs> attempts at simplifying and purifying our tax code. 
Uh, and then when we get done, it's probably about five times thicker, the tax code, than it was before. And if you look at uh, why, it's because this group or that group said, yeah, you tax them, but don't tax me because I'm worthy of not being taxed. And all of a sudden, you have all these exemptions. And now there's a push uh, on the national level that maybe we ought to just throw out the income tax and go to a value-added tax, which is sort of a sales tax. But I, I would contend, unless again, you control your special interest groups, what you will have is a value added tax or a sales tax on a national level, but all the interest groups that uh, maybe people who have uh, oil or gas or coal or what happens, oh, not our product, and so they'll lobby that they have an exemption uh, from the applicability of that tax, and that's where you need to, that's why if you want to have a product that passes the smell test, you really do have to disenfranchise uh, the money and the interest groups because they do pervert, really, the attempts at whether it's reforming the political finance system or the tax code or whatever it happens to be. The groups that are left out there uh, do tend to get their way. Uh, we see it in agricultural policies. Um, for many years, uh, you know, people have lamented, we ought not be subsidizing in any way tobacco. Well. Tobacco is a big interest in this country and the lifeblood of many farmers. And as a result, that was something that uh, lasted for many, many years. Yeah. Uh, we could go back to them, not a products uh, where exemptions have been wrought. And you say, well, why is that in the tax code? Well, I can tell you why. There's probably mm -hmm. a well-paid lobbyist and a lot of campaign contributions. Uh, now, it's not always that simple, but sometimes it's because the uh, community of mm -hmm. elected representative <laughs> happens to have a but, lot of tobacco plants <laughs> or something in in their jurisdiction. But uh, we do need to make it at least uh, pass the smell test in a lot of our votes and decisions that are made on, on a national and a state legislative level uh, do not, and they ought to have more public policy uh, ramifications that are that are positive in a sense of helping let me, people. Let me just ask Ken, just in terms of, you're our social studies guy, um, has money uh, can, it, it, money has been spent on on campaigns throughout our history? Isn't that true? Uh, sure, and the courts and I think the the real the real difficulty in, in building on what Tom says is until you get to and I hate to be a purist here, but the the Supreme Court is basically has continued to say that so far you know they've tried to negotiate around the edges, but money equals free speech. And, and how people want to spend their money is an important part of their First Amendment rights to political expression. And until you have that in the equation of uh, the Buckley uh, decision, you know, unless you're willing to go to a national, you know, taxpayer-based uh, sort of, you know, pay, pay candidates and pay people after they reach a certain threshold of public opinion, I don't know how you're going to get money out of the system. Um, and, and then the perception always is going to be that... Um, Government is for, you know, for hire. You know, political scientists have been trying to study this thing for 25, 30 years, and they're going to tell you that, uh, you know, television ads don't influence voters, uh, ultimately, when they vote. They'll tell you that study after study shows that money buys you maybe access, but certainly there isn't any, in, you know, there isn't any real clear evidence that it actually buys votes, per se. But, boy, well, you know, there are a lot of, you know, a good number of political studies, and, you know, you, you, you know, go to political science down the hall here at the center in 141, or whatever they call it, and, You'll see that stuff in the basic poli sci primers, but I just, you know, my experience has been as as a guy who, you know, used to be the bag. Well, I wasn't really the bag man for the union, but, uh, you know, I had, to, I had, you know, but I was, but I was, but I was yeah, I want to invoke my Fifth Amendment rights here at this point. But you have an attorney right here. No kidding. I, I want to talk to counsel and we'll take a break right now. But I. You know, I've had opportunities where, you know, you represent a, a group of, say, 800 teachers in the local community, and you talk to local board members, and you, um, there, isn't a, there isn't certainly a quid pro quo where I walk in and say, we can provide a certain amount of PAC money for you, but we need your vote on this, this, and this when it comes up in front of the school board. You know, it's not as crass as that. But people, you know, I don't know, you know, Cal, maybe the real world is, was different, but I think people understand that these are the folks who are helping you pay for the lawn signs. This is on a local level, much less, you know, mm -hmm. NFL you know, politics up in Washington or even in Madison. Um, they understand where the lawn signs come from. They understand where your foot soldiers come from. And, and those are the people that you're certainly going to probably put your thumb on the scale if you have to vote. And... You know, I think uh, you see that playing out in Madison in educational policy. You know, um, national, you know, the Association of Manufacturers has their, their, you know, I think they're number three in the state. 
Uh, my, my union, you know, <laughs> is number one in the state in spending. And you see that there is absolutely no agreement because everything is so polarized about how to deal with state financing of education. Well, and, then you, um, and then you fold in uh, a, another bill that's pending in the legislature. I think it's AB 46, which is going to make, presumed to make, many changes to the campaign finance rules and regulations. And I have been the uh, treasurer for a number of campaigns, uh, local campaigns, and trying to pick your way through uh, the regulations, the, oh, yeah. the statutory requirements as well as administrative code regulations just relating to how much money you can bring in. And do you know, for example, that the limitation per year for the mayoral contribution is $507.92? Uh, I mean, these are, there's the 45% uh, percent rule, there's the 65% percent rule. You know, I've been to school for a lot of years, and I'm scratching my head trying to figure out what these rules and regulations are, and it is just like the tax code. You look at the at AB 46, I think that's the right number, and it adds, as far as I could tell from just skimming through it, another level of complexity to an already pretty complicated system in terms of trying to keep people honest uh, with, with campaign uh, finance contributions. So, I mean, both from the theoretical level and just from the practical level as, as some poor campaign treasurer who's trying to figure out, is this legal, is this not legal? It's tough stuff out there, and I just wonder whose interests we're serving. I mean, until just recently, Wisconsin had certainly a reputation as a pretty clean state in terms of government. I think that reputation has been tarnished somewhat. But still you think, gee, in Wisconsin, aren't we going to play it right, and aren't we going to be, aren't we going to be true to ourselves? Well, I don't know. I, I think it's pretty tough. Well, you know, the whole campaign finance uh, initiative started with the whole Nixon administration um, era. And uh, after the Nixon uh, years, we had the public financing statute for presidential oh, elections. Yes. And off. we went, we modeled, uh, we followed suit on a state level with a public finance law mm -hmm. of our own. And basically the Buckley Vallejo case, which struck down uh, spending limits and, and contribution limits, basically, uh, stated that if you don't accept public financing, uh, the government has no right to put right. any type right. of control. So the free speech was, the hinge was on the public financing. And what happened, basically, over time is that public financing uh, set such strict limits and provided such minimal amount of support for a campaign that candidates just said, I can't support a campaign on 15,000, I think it sure. was for an assembly race, and 30 some thousand for a Senate race. Uh, they were costing you know, hundreds of thousands. And so candidates just abandoned the system, and legislative bodies really were lamenting then uh, the fact that the court has said that unless they take public financing, you can't do anything about it. I vehemently uh, disagree with the court. I think that the government is the government of the people and that whether you accept public money or not, you accept public confidence, you have public expectation of doing a decent job, and I think the, the, the uh, court was way off base. I don't know where, what they were uh, uh, drinking or smoking when they had that, made that decision, but I really think the government is indeed uh, beholden to the public and to, to the public good, and I don't care whether you accept public financing or not, uh, special interest group money ought to be limited uh, to a certain amount. I'm not precluding that you shouldn't you know, realistically allow teachers or manufacturing commerce to participate in some mm -hmm. way, but when it starts getting into figures that are much more than any other uh, individual would ever participate, yeah. uh, as Ken pointed out, uh, there's going to be some semblance of sensitivity to the fact sure. after the election somebody gave that candidate uh, many, many dollars, and there, I think their point of view is going to be somewhat uh, corrupted by the fact that the monies were as large as they are. Tom, how, how last do you, word how, on no, this topic. Just how do you handle the sidebar discussion? Those that are in make the rules to stay in. Well, that's yeah, a sidebar yeah. discussion. It goes there that the government, you said, the government needs to make the rules. So True, real campaign finance reform, and we don't know what it would look like or how it would be implemented, is truly, a, I think, a revolutionary concept because it changes how business gets done. Mm -hmm. And because of that, like tax policy, is a major social policy that not only raises money but 
just governs so many ways that we live our lives and what we value and what we don't value. I'm going to segue right into our next topic as, as time is running a little short. Uh, and I'm sure as the, the bill makes its way through, uh, through uh, the legislature, we'll, we'll revisit it because it is pretty interesting stuff. Um, there has been an effort at the local, state, and now national level to address uh, inequities in the minimum wage. Minimum wage, I believe, in the state of Wisconsin remains at $5.15 an hour. Um, uh, Governor Doyle has uh, tried on a couple of occasions to raise the minimum state minimum wage, I believe, I'm not sure the exact amount, Six twenty-five an hour is what comes to mind, but I could be wrong there. And just yesterday, Cal, I think you indicated that the federal government... Today, uh, matter of fact, it as was we today. are taping this, the U.S. Senate voted down both the Democrat and the Republican proposals to raise the federal minimum wage. Yeah, and I think as I heard that... Um, uh, that same uh, branch of government has raised its salary to the tune of about $28,000 uh, in the, the last four or five years. Thoughts, comments? Well, are, view, we ever, are we ever yeah, going to get people gonna, uh, But above? I view minimum wage as a, a teenager getting a job, and, I, I, you know, and they started to sell. That's kind of how I view it. Now, some people have a little different view. Uh, and McDonald's locally, I think at one point they were paying six fifty because they couldn't find anybody. So the minimum wage was five fifteen, but they're paying six fifty or something like that. They they're looking for people who could deliver a product, and you get a young kid. Well, I guess they have not only young kids, but they have uh, ad uh, adults working there too, and they pay them accordingly uh, as best they can to, uh, to keep them. Uh, kids nowadays uh, sign up for six fifty, and uh, two weeks later they find a job for nine, and three weeks later they find a job for twelve, and they just boom, 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 and. Um, well, not in Sheboygan. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I don't know. <laughs> so it's kind of uh, where do you, you know, put the bottom line for you people to begin to work and, and, and move? And that's kind of how I look yeah, at it. My beef with it is is that even if the minimum wage was five fifteen back in nineteen, Cal, when was the last time it was changed? Nineteen ninety seven, if right. I'm not mistaken. Right, the national um, wage, yeah. Yeah. yeah um, we're almost 10 years down the line. Uh, even if 515 was even considered to be an adequate minimum wage, applying the same sure, philosophy you that you did, bit. just teenagers or or it's just women because you know they don't really need the money. That used to no, be no, the no, philosophy. No, that, that used to be I the philosophy that. that you know women provided the pin money. You know the the second income. But in any event, that's that's just my little bias coming out. But. Uh, why can't we change it now just to reflect inflation, diminution of buying power? Well, that's the What's reason the why we ought to address it. And, and you know, the, the pure conservative would say capitalism is ruled by law, supply, and demand, and therefore uh, we ought, government, we ought to stay out of the whole issue of spending or setting limits. But the problem is that those factors in the economy don't always apply in every community. Um, in most cases, the scenario that Tom has, has portrayed is, is true. For for the last couple of years, McDonald's have been, the fast food type mm -hmm. joints have been paying a lot more than five fifteen, probably $7, $6.50, $7 an hour. And it's been due to the fact of competition of workers. But that holds true in some communities, but not in others. There are communities where you've had massive layoffs, you know, maybe a rural community in northern Wisconsin, uh, very much a shortage of jobs. And, and as a result, the economic factors that would give people choices and give them uh, higher wages than a minimum wage are just not there. And what do you then do to protect a worker from being exploited? And there are people who would exploit workers. We see that with, with undocumented uh, immigrants, uh, sweatshops. You can go to New York Garment District and find uh, innumerable people uh, who are, are working for less than minimum wage. And why are they? Because those folks are, will not stick their head into the legal system and say, I'm getting ripped off here, I'm being exploited, this is a sweatshop. They know that they're not even supposed to be here, let alone have that job, so that they're being exploited by unscrupulous people who are simply trying to make a buck. Now, you know, somebody else would say, well, is that the government's job to protect people who uh, can't speak out against the inequities? But I would say that exploiting people is wrong. And I don't care if you're legal or illegal, exploiting people is wrong, and you ought not to do it. And there are people who do do it. And as a result, uh, we can, I think, after passage now of seven or eight years, set
say that five some dollars an hour ought to be maybe six twenty five an hour, even though again probably eighty ninety percent of people are not even working for that. The fact of the matter is there are some, and there are some people that ought not to be um, exploiting other people and really, if they are caught exploiting that 's another way to nail their their ears to the wall here legally by saying you not only are exploiting these people in a sweatshop environment, you're violating what you should be paying them. So it is a tool in a way of preventing exploitation of labor. Well, it, Traditionally, up until about the mid-70s, minimum wage was around 50 percent of the average working wage in this country. Mm -hmm. Right now the average working wage is around $15 an hour. And we're seeing it five. So, so clearly, minimum wage hasn't kept up. And the yeah. Kennedy proposal, which was which got shot down, would have put it pretty much in that same traditional ratio. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of adjusting for inflation, minimum wage peaked in the late '60s already, and it's been downhill. It's, I think, it's a difficult case to make to to tell a family, a single family, uh, that you work 40, 45 hours a week and at minimum wage, and you're still below the poverty level. And that's, a, I mean, that that just a, it's equitably, in terms of equity, it's a tough sell. Um, I know in the fast, the problem with social, with the minimum wages is that when you raise the minimum wage, you are going to lose some workers in the mix. I mean, that's, that is the basic law of supply and demand. That you're going to price some workers out of the market, and that's the traditional, and that was the argument made on the Senate floor yesterday when they were debating this bill, is you're basically making entry worker jobs that much more difficult to do. Clinton administration tried something a little bit different. They tried the earned income tax credit. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that was remarkably successful in raising incomes in that lower level uh, without having to uh, mess around with labor markets. The difficulty there was there was a certain amount of fraud, to be sure, and there's a certain amount of paperwork that um, lower-income families have to negotiate, which is a little bit difficult for them to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I was, and then, you know, uh, that great liberal Republican, Richard Nixon, you know, proposed something along the same lines when he talked about a, a, a minimum, you know, uh, basically, a negative income tax is what he called it to make it more palatable, but it basically is the assumption that if you're working, if you're working 40 hours a week and you're paying your dues and you're paying your taxes and you're a good citizen, you should have a reasonable level of income to support your family. That doesn't seem like a terribly, you know, awful thing to ask of a country that spends billions of dollars in cat food and dog food every year. And it really focuses on working. You know, yeah. your tax credit exactly. uh, mechanism is that even though you may not earn enough to have to file, be required yeah. to file, you do get a rate, uh, you get money back from the federal government, but there's no guarantee that you're pulling your weight yeah. uh, in the workforce. And so, whereas when you're talking about minimum wage, you're basically applying it to somebody who has works a minimum number yeah. of hours, mm -hmm. and, and you're really putting forth the fact that you're putting forth an effort to help yourself. Yeah. And, and while you're doing that, we're going to at least say you, you should get a minimum amount of pay for the effort that you're putting forth. See, it plays out differently in different companies and different industries. You know, McDonald's and, and the fast food industry, for example, you know, scream about the, any, any type of increase in minimum wage. And the studies, again, show that really you, they, don't, they don't really get rid of any workers. You know, without turning this into an economic seminar, they're really insensitive to those kinds of, of yeah. wage increases. But small business people, on the other hand, are extremely sensitive to those kind of changes, and it makes it difficult yeah. sometimes for them to hire workers, uh, depending on the type of situation. You've There's got. also some stereotypes of, of what we pay types of workers. Uh, for example, in, in, in Europe, uh, people who work in restaurants and, and in some of your service industries get paid a great deal more than they do in the United States. And uh, one of the things that we hear in this country uh, is that, well, people wouldn't be able to afford to go to a restaurant and whatever if the, if the pay was too high in, in, in a restaurant. But the, the, what you hear from Europeans in response is that these are very worthy jobs, that some of the service and the restaurant positions, why have we elevated manufacturing in certain types of jobs to be paid well, and these service centers, taking care of children in a daycare center or working in a restaurant, is somehow uh, low-pay work that maybe we ought to, in many cases, send a message that if we are indeed going from an industrial society to a more service society, that some of the jobs that we are now creating in a society ought to pay more that it's worthy mm -hmm. to, to, to be working in a restaurant. It's worthy to take care of little children and let's pay people like we used to pay people who made cars or steel or some other type of uh, product. Tom, you were gonna... No, it's a, another kind of... Madison is doing it, uh, Milwaukee's doing it, uh, versus having kind of a state 
uh, mandate. So that's kind of another issue. Should you let the local communities uh, do it, or should it be a state, or should it be federal? And interestingly enough, that uh, the the minimum wage being done at, at at the local level is really being framed in terms of of a living wage, and so mm. you have groups that figure out. If you're just a, a normal person living in a modest apartment with or without health insurance, how much money do you need to make an hour in order to just live without, say, the government subsidies, subsidies of food stamps or medical assistance or whatever else might be available? And those, those really range from like 9 to $11 an hour just to have a $500 a month apartment, which doesn't get you that much these days, and paying the utilities and so forth. Um, I think you framed the argument is that minimum wage is not necessarily a living wage. It clearly is not. It so clearly is not. Do we want to have a base living wage or what is the role of the minimum wage? Right. It's not necessarily. A, and I a, think that um, uh, at least in some of the iterations that I saw, it was pegged as government, um, the, the living wage would apply to government contracts so that if you wanted to do government work, you'd have to pay a living wage. And I'm not sure I'm not sure the status in Milwaukee and Madison, do we have those those um, were those minimum wage um, provisions actually enacted? I don't know. Milwaukee and Madison did pass uh, okay. yeah. and I think the the impetus there was that the state and the federal government wasn't doing anything and as a result progressive local city councils council. say we're going to show them and we're going <laughs> to set yeah. the stage and we're going to expect these things in our communities. Yeah, and, and I think uh, they actually, maybe at the local level there is more political will. I, I don't know. I know there was a group in Sheboygan that was working on this issue and simply gave it up as not being an obtainable goal uh, to, to implement a, a living wage uh, uh, within Sheboygan County. So hard to say where, uh, where that's going to go or, or how, mm -hmm. how it's going to happen. Um, any ties, we just talked about this briefly before the show, and we just have a minute left. Um, efforts to tie minimum wage to the current bankruptcy reform litigation on a national level? Well, that's what Senator Kennedy tried to do yesterday was, and is to attach that as an amendment to the provision, and that amendment process got shot down yesterday, and then the bill itself must have been yeah. voted down today. And what, were the, what was the substance of the amendment? This, well, it was basically if you're going to approve the bankruptcy bill, you're going to approve a minimum wage of, I think the Kennedy proposal was something like 750 or 775 an hour, that sort of thing. All right. Well, and that's, of course, another additional topic of conversation. And the wonderful thing about this group is we always have lots to talk about. So we'll see you again.